So what do you feel about Ramanujan's idea, particularly the first one, that every real equation or that, that, that gives you that sense of beauty and, and inspires you has to be an idea in the mind of God? Well, I, I, think, I think Ramanujan is great because he contradicts everything that mathematics is supposed to be. And Ramanujan was a great mathematician, and he's saying... An equation is a value only if it expresses one of God's thoughts. And, and he believed that, that all his ideas were given to him by the goddess Nanagiri while he slept. This is, and, and Hardy said he, ha, he couldn't teach Ramanujan what a proof was. You know, Ramanujan worked purely on inspiration. I mean, we don't know how it worked. And, 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 and if you look at, uh, there, I'll give you two other examples. Another exa- ma- mathematician, that is very different from what mathematicians are supposed to be like, is Georg Cantor. Georg Cantor created an unbelievably marvelous theory about infinite sets. Right. And a lot of the mathematics of the previous century, of the 20th century, is in a way in the spirit of, of, of Cantor's work because it has what is called a set theoretic viewpoint. Uh, you know, But if you look at Cantor, he is the most weird, uh, contradictory person. Cantor was trying to understand God and infinity, the, the series about infinite sets for him was a way to get closer to God. God is infinite or, you know, transcendently infinite, not just infinite, yeah. more infinite than any infinity that we can imagine. And, and, and Cantor's theory as a mathematical theory is a big problem because it's full of contradictions and paradoxes. You start reasoning along the direction that Cantor starts, which sounds very reasonable. If you eliminate the theology, which was his inspiration, you know, you just hide that and take the rest of the text, it sounds okay. But then you, you get a contradiction. For example, the set of everything, the universal set, that sounds like a sort of a reasonable thing. Yeah, yeah. But there is a result that Cantor has that the set of all subsets of a set is bigger than the set. So the set of all subsets of the set of everything should be bigger than the set of everything, but nothing can be bigger than the set of everything. So Cantor was not, uh, Cantor knew about this paradox. He didn't shout it to the four winds, but it didn't bother him because, you know, we're finite beings and to understand God, obviously God for us is paradoxical. We cannot understand something that transcends us. So there, he sort of, I think, he sort of, you know, took it in his stride. That, there are paradoxes involved in trying to understand this stuff. But the math community was terrified because you were getting contradictions. You know, you were getting pieces of reasoning that seem very simple and straightforward, and then you're saying one equals zero, you know? And, and, and this was like, a, this was like a, this, a disease that was attacking the, you know, termites eating the foundation of a, of a wooden building of your home. Cantor didn't feel that way, but Bertrand Russell and a lot of other... Uh, Poincaré, Henri Poincaré, said this is a disease from which he hopes future generations will recover. Another math, the German mathematician said that Cantor was corrupting youth, you know. But this is an absolutely wonderful, breathtaking theory. And they sort of sanitized it. They emasculated it. They hid all the dangerous bits, and they tried to, you know. And, 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 and then a lot of that really changed the whole spirit of mathematics from the 19th century to the 20th mm-hmm. century. So Cantor is tremendously influential, and nobody talks about why he created this theory and the unbelievable problems that it led to. People prefer to forget about all that, but, it, but you shouldn't forget about it. This is an example of mathematical creativity, like Ramanujan, that goes against all the standard ideas. You know, the mathematician is rational, and, and it's, I, I prefer to take the other extreme. To be provocative, I always exaggerate. My, I feel like mathematics is based only on emotion and inspiration. And it's totally irrational. And, and, and we don't know where it comes from. And we're like, we're like poets or painters, you know, uh, uh, what do they call it? Uh, poet ma- Maudit, I think, mm-hmm. you know. It's, it's an, it could, especially in cases where it's an obsession rather than a profession. You know, I guess there are some mathematicians who just view it as a nine to five job and they could, they could be a butcher or anything else. Of which you are not. Some of us, it's a, it's an obsession. And then you wake up. You wake up, you know, at the age of 60, you say, where did my life go? You know, I, uh, you, you, got, you got seduced by this when you were 15, and, and, and then you blink, and all of a sudden you're 60. Where did it go? Well, it went in something very intense, but the rest of your life sort of went by at a gallop, and you didn't even notice. You know, so it's an obsession. 
And I think the case of, of Cantor is, is like that, and the case of Ramanujan is like that. And there's a, let me give you another example of a really great mathematician that doesn't fit our standard view of what mathematics is, and that's Leonard Euler. Now, Euler created a lot of the mathematics that physicists and engineers use, a lot of mathematics that people use a lot. And, and it was just like a, a, a river, you know, like a torrent of creativity. And you read Euler's papers, and you can follow his reasoning step by step, but where does it all come from? Every week he would do another wonderful paper. And he gave the whole train of thought, so while you're reading the paper you think, well, I could have done this. <laughs> but no. And not only that, a lot of what Euler did now is considered not to be rigorous. Um, he dealt with uh, un, you know, sums which are called divergent which means our current attitude is that they don't have a sum. It's an infinite sum. And, and it, that it's his own nonsense. But somehow Euler, even though he, his proofs were sometimes, many, you know, many times, they were not what nowadays would be considered a valid proof, he discovered all this mathematics. You know, if you insist on, a, on what today is a valid proof, on complete rigor, Euler could never have discovered all the incredible mathematics he discovered. So, okay, later generations, you know, dotted the I's and crossed the T's. But where did all those ideas come from? How, how, it's like, it's, it's like a waterfall, you know, it's, well, it's just amazing. So, so I think that mathematics is not rational. There's something mysterious about mathematical creativity. I wish, I wish we could understand it. And the statement that logicians sometimes make, that mathematical creativity is just applying logic to a small set of commonly agreed on principles, I'm sorry, that was, in my opinion, that's absolute nonsense. And Gödel already showed in 1931 it's nonsense, but no one wants to listen. 